Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. I am here with Charles Hain, cinematographer, director. He's the acting director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema and the co-host of the No Film School Podcast. Charles, thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. So excited to be here. I am a, I'm a big fan of Lens Rentals. So oh, thank happy you. To, we happy we to appreciate it. Given your, given your resume and experience, we could cover a, a wide range of subjects. But I, I think we want to stick to lighting with apps today. Charles and I are going to talk about kind of lighting with apps. What are some good resources for that? But first, um, before we get into specifics, I want to ask you, Charles, what you look for in a light in general. So the first thing I'm always looking at when I look at any lighting sources, I look at actual spectral response. I was one of those people who really dragged their feet on LEDs for a long time. Mm -hmm. LEDs have obviously been giving us like a, an amazing lighting power to energy power ratio for a really long time. But one of the frustrations we've all had with LEDs is that the spectral reproduction really wasn't there for a really long time. So the first thing we're always looking for is like, you know, uh, Everybody at this point should probably know, but if you don't, CRI and TLCI are not great ways to measure spectral response. The big problem with both of those measurements is that, you know, there's these like 15 or 20 random color chips. And both of those measurements are really designed to see like how accurate is it on those color chips. But the color chips are not a really broad, you know, it's 15 colors. There's millions of colors in reality. And just because it can accurately reproduce these 15 or 20 colors, you're not necessarily getting the reproduction you want across the whole spectrum. I mean, you guys at Lens Rentals definitely know, like, there are color shifts in the the spectrum of a lens that you're always right. tr hoping to work out for. You're always hoping, you know, whatever the coding, you're getting really nice response over the full spectrum of the light. And one of the things to really pay attention to it's funny, a, a buddy of mine bitches about this more than I do, so I feel like I'm sort of parroting him, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and bitch about it anyway. It's like, you know, a lot of lighting manufacturers get really obsessed with like, these lights are accurate to daylight, but it's like, well, daylight on a Sony camera looks different than a daylight on a red camera looks different than daylight on an Aerie. Like, it's this whole system. It's the lens and the sensor and the light all together that gives us good color reproduction. And for that to work its best, you want really broad spectrum lighting. So I'm one of those guys that still, you know, my little three light setup for my podcast interviews. I have an RGB light as my backlight because I don't really care as much about backlight accuracy mm -hmm. for my little podcast thing. But my both of my two front lights are both daylight balanced units that give a really nice broad spectrum. And then I use gels on them to try and get them to where I want the color to be because I feel like you want to start with that broad spectrum and then be shaping it from there. I feel like we're finally getting there with LEDs. There's certainly some daylight LEDs now that I feel like give you a really nice spectrum. You know, when you're looking at RGB, there's people like Hive who have like the five different colored diodes mm -hmm. giving you a much broader spectrum of light. But you still run into these scenarios where like, you know, you've got an RGB unit and someone whose skin tone skews a little greener or a little more magenta than neutral. And the interaction of like their skin tone and your RGB unit is very unflattering. So I am still a big fan of, you know, if I could. If I could light everything tungsten, which of course requires a lot of lighting units and a lot of power, and it's not always the most environmentally friendly uh, way to do things. I still love that big, broad tungsten spectrum where you're getting like all of the frequencies of light. This is the first time I'm going to say this on a podcast, but it does start to feel like tungsten light is a little irresponsible in terms of climate change. Definitely. Yeah. In a lot of cases, if you're on a set, especially those larger lights, those are getting run off of gas powered generators yeah has anyone done that uh like hit us up on twitter if anybody has done the math on the impact of like tungsten lighting on film sets versus led lighting on film sets for climate change like i'd be very curious i, I know that there is a company i can't remember their name um we'll find it and we'll put it in the show notes but i, I know this because we looked into some of their stuff and it was it ended up being a little too heavy and cumbersome for us to carry as a rental product, but I was interested in it and saw it at Cinegear, and they're running basically a traditional generator, but entirely battery powered. And a lot of their their selling point on that is 
not necessarily price or convenience because it's more expensive and less convenient, but it is purely just a climate renewable energy pitch on these generators. I can't, I wish I could remember what they're called. Green something. Yeah, no, I remember seeing them at NAB or Cinegear as well and being like, ooh, yeah, somebody needs to be doing that. That's really smart. Although it is not really the kind of thing you're going to ship through the air. And then I guess their argument is right. like, you got a solar power at home, you keep it charged up, you bring it to set, you're running that solar power. That's an interesting... I mean, look, I think the real... The truth of the matter is, climate change or not, we're moving into a place where LEDs are going to become the dominant units on a lot of productions in the next five to 10 years. And so as we do that, we really want to be paying attention to like, we don't feel like we have a lot of power as consumers, but we do. We buy stuff. Our dollars have value. Our opinions have value. So like, what do we want to be pushing our LED manufacturers to do? I feel like there's a lot of pressure right now on everybody to have an RGB unit, but I also feel like there's not enough discussion of like the limits of those RGB units in terms of like skin tone reproducibility and stuff like that. What we want as filmmakers is we want like to craft beautiful images. And one of the interesting things about me about even starting, I have like two or three RGB lights now is 80% of the time I still end up using them not to create a crazy party color. Maybe if I was a music video DP, I would be using a lot more crazy party colors, but I'm still I'm still more interested in like output and even color reproduction than anything else. The other thing I'm starting to look for more and more in lights that I didn't use to is portability. It's something that didn't used to matter me a lot because you're always doing a job on a truck and who cares how lightweight they are. But as again, we're trying to move to smaller trucks. We're trying to do more stuff out of vans. I still have this dream that I'll be able to ride my bike to a shoot and do a, like an interview shoot by bicycle. And, uh, you know, getting to smaller units that you could do a backpack thing that you can climb up and carry up into the woods with you and have sort of a nice lighting set up is sort of an interesting thing to think about. So, yeah, I mean, that's where I am right now in terms of light shopping when I'm picking up new units. For sure. Yeah. It depends, I guess, a lot on what you're shooting and what your needs are. Like one of the big things for me, I shoot a lot of documentary stuff. And one of the bigger things for me in switching from like a tungsten kit to LEDs is is heat. As if you're, yes. if you're working with people who are not used to working with lights, if you're interviewing somebody who's not, you know, an actor, LEDs being a little cooler just kind of makes everybody more comfortable. And the interview can go a lot better if people are uh, not uncomfortable. Yeah, no, that is a really huge one. It's also one of those funny things that's changed with digital technology, because I remember so much. One of the first tests I ever did for a production, like 2003, I was shooting a thing on film and the actor agreed to come to the tests. And I really wanted to shoot it on 100 ASA film because I wanted that like fine grained image. And I turned a nine light on this poor actor, like mm. 10 feet away from this actor full bore because I wanted this like three stops over a key backlight. And, you know, the actor like sat there and did it and was very nice. And then after a few minutes, they were like, are you really going to try and shoot it like this? And I looked and he was sweating and I felt so bad and I apologized. And I was like, you know, physical comfort of performers is part of the factor in all of this, especially in interviews. And, yeah, if I'm out there doing an interview and I can use LEDs and frankly, if I can use a camera like a Vericam and crank it up to 5000 ASA so I don't have to be as bright with the lights. And someone who might not be as comfortable in an interview is getting lit without something that they feel like is glaring in their face. And then I use a little noise correction in post to bring the noise down. I feel like, especially in doc, you want subjects to feel like they're in the world that they naturally are in. Getting into the the app-based lighting, what do you think generally are the advantages of working with an app to control your lights? The whole reason I'm talking about lighting with apps today, and it's been my, you know, I, like most filmmakers, I try and have a research project every year where I try and make sure I'm learning something new every year. And uh, this all came about because I was talking to a DP buddy of mine this summer and he was doing a shoot that was all sky panel. And he was like, yeah. And on the test day, I played with the Stellar app and it was great. And we were having all this fun time. And then I got to the shoot and nobody on the crew would fire up Stellar. Everything I wanted to do. They sent a person out to the light unit to do. And, you know, this is like a medium, big size DP shooting a bunch of commercial stuff and, uh, you know, a good size gaffer. And I realized that there's this weird reluctance happening about filmmakers are a little slow to adapt to things. And it, and I had this interesting realization where I was like, oh, my God, every film school where I've ever taught, there's a DMX board. And at every film school where I've ever taught. No one uses the DMX board. It sits there covered by its cover. The one exception was LACC 
LACC, we use the board a lot. So shout out to LACC. Really proud of you guys for using the board. Although that board was a very simple and easy to use board and we had training on it. But everywhere else I've ever taught, the DMX board just sits under its cover at every film school. And I realized there's this weird reluctance in film. And I think it's twofold. One reluctance in film of getting into stuff like DMX and getting into stuff like lighting with apps is, you know, DMX was really invented for live event lighting. And in live event lighting, you tend to, even if it's a traveling road show, you have like an eight hour day before the concert at night where you're setting up all your lighting. And so spending longer on lighting is a very normal thing. But also if you're like lighting a Broadway show, you'll light for several weeks and then it'll run for six months. So spending more time setting things up properly Makes a lot of sense in that world, whereas, you know, especially in indie features, I know DMX is very common on big TV shows and I know DMX is very common on big features. But like when I when I'm looking at the world of like the jobs I'm around and the people I know where it's like one day commercial shoots, three day music video shoots, like two month feature shoots, DMX just doesn't have a place there because we we work so quickly. And so, you know, we'll regularly I was actually just reading The Irishman. They were regularly going through three locations a day on The Irishman. And I was like, that's the Irishman. And they're shooting an indie feature schedule because of the level of ambition versus budget and stuff like that. So remote control of lights has not really come to film except at the high, high levels. You know, my friends who do live event are like, oh, my God, guys, you guys are so backwards. App based control and DMX control and stuff is something we've all been doing for 20 years. But it's just not a common thing in film. And I was like, that's weird, but it seems like it must be coming. So I just set this as my research project for the fall was, all right, well, I'm going to try and get really good at lighting with apps and try and start talking about lighting with apps a lot. The other reason I think film has been so slow to do it is, frankly, I think that there's a habit in film of just using more people to solve problems. Like Mm -hmm. there's that expression, Hollywood it. Oh, I need a flag there, but I'm in a rush. Just Hollywood it. Just have physical humans do it. And I think there's a little bit of fear that if we start getting really good with lighting with apps, there'll be fewer jobs. I don't think that's actually true. We're still going to need people to put up the stand and put the light on the stand and run the cable to the light. And I think actually of all of the apps out there, I think the smartest people, there's two companies who are sort of doing the most interesting stuff on this lighting with app space. And one is uh, Luminaire who are in Kentucky of all places. And they are just, uh, it's synth effects is the company. They are just worried about the app. And I think they're really interesting because they are, we're just going to do the app. And then, of course, the other people doing really interesting stuff are Aerie. And I think what's interesting about what Aerie's doing is Aerie's doing multiple users in the same app environment. So Mm -hmm. as opposed to a situation where, you know, I'm the DP and I have the iPad and I'm sitting here at the monitor and I can dial everything on the iPad. You can also let other people join the same group. And so the gaffer can be out there at the stage looking at the unit and they can also fire it up and have local control. And I think the multi users that we're getting out of Airy with their Stellar app is kind of a fascinating space. But before we go into them too much, I do. I just want to talk about what I think is interesting about SynthFX and Luminaire. And I think it's the third factor in why lighting with apps is sort of slower to take off in motion pictures than it is in other industries. And that is the people who make lights aren't always going to be the best people to make apps. and aren't always going to have the full infrastructure to support it. I'm about to talk a lot of trash about a light and I'm not going to say the company, the light, because I'm going to talk so much trash about it, but um, you know, one of the big led companies, and I'm not going to say which they have an app that's total screaming garbage. And like the app is all over their marketing. The app is all over their thing, but you know, and the light is nice. I like Mm -hmm. the light, but the, uh, it has really nice spectral reproduction. It has all sorts of cool features built in. But the problem is, is we're in sort of a, explosion of led lighting companies there's so many there's aperture and there's hive and there's quasar and there's um digital sputnik and then i'm just looking around my office at like boxes and and spreadsheets and stuff and like there's so many people in this space i feel like i can't even keep track of everybody you actually sent me in the prep for this interview you sent me a link to a couple people and like what do you think of their app and i hadn't even heard of some of those companies they're all startups they're all small they're all young they're all hungry they all want to do everything and if your expertise right. is in hardware Software development is a lot harder than people give it credit for. And it's especially hard in the app space because, you know, with iPhone, you you have a reasonably small number of devices you have to support. But with Android, you know, if you're going to have Android support, there's so many different devices you have to test it on and see how it's working. And so this one company, big company, one of the prominent names in the space, I got their light. I tested it at the prep day. I made sure everything I wanted to do worked at the prep day. I then taught a class and I used it in the class and I showed all the students how to do this thing in the class and it worked. And then I had a shoot 
And I was like, oh, I'm going to use this cool feature in this app that's like part of the shoot. And it just didn't work. It crashed on my phone. It crashed on my iPad. I had my uh, best electric installed it on his phone and his iPad, and it just didn't work. And I think that's the other fear we all have about this is that, you know, these are people who are really good at lighting, who are dipping their toe in software. And I've talked to some of these companies and some of these companies are like, oh my God, I wish I didn't have to do an app. It's a completely different expertise. It's not something we want to have to do. It's something we feel like we have to do. It's also something that like, other than Aerie and Luminaire, nobody's actually getting anyone to pay for these apps, right? Right. Like all the other apps are free. So it's like, I have to do this, but I can't make any money from doing this. I really wish everybody would just really push to support Luminaire. Yes, most of the photo companies have their own photo processing app, but they also work really well with Lightroom. And Lightroom is better than most of the company's photo processing apps because Adobe, an independent company that doesn't make their own camera, puts a lot of effort into supporting all the cameras and to doing that. And right now where we are is we're in this space where Luminaire which has been around since 2008, they launched like in the early app store launching space is like, we're going to be the really great app for DMX control and we're going to play with everybody. So right now, any light that does DMX control, you can make work with Luminaire. And because of that, Luminaire, I think is in it, is in sort of an interesting space. And you actually see that with Quasar, like the Quasar rainbows in the little manual Mm -hmm. for the Quasar rainbows. I don't know that they even have their own app. I think that they just dedicatedly are like, you should work with Luminaire, which like, yes, Luminaire costs money. But what you're getting out of paying for it is you're getting like a really robust, sophisticated app that works natively with Quasars that you can program to work with your sky panel, that you can program to work with all sorts of other things. And by doing that, you're in this space where you have a lot more control. I don't think they have multi-user input right now. I think that is missing in Luminaire. I think it's like you've got one user. Although I'm going to be honest, as much as I think it's cool that Stellar does that, I haven't actually, it's so hard to get everybody to install the apps anyway. I think it's probably enough right. if you can just get one person to start using it. For sure. And luckily, unlike some of the wireless DMX built into like the Sky Panel or the Orbiter or, you know, newer lights, standard DMX with open protocol receivers and transmitters has been an industry standard for years. So yeah. you're much more likely to find lower budget lights with just a DMX input that you can adapt to wireless DMX. It's almost more helpful for a small crew than a large crew because you don't have so many people to adjust lights manually. Also, the the other thing driving all of this is that we've got accurate monitoring in a way. Ten years ago, you didn't really want someone sitting at a monitor tweaking all the lights from one place. You wanted to be out there standing with the actors with your light meter and your color meter looking at levels. And you had to do all the math in your head and the previs in your head to sort of figure out how it's all going to look on film because, you know, it was film. But now we are in a space where, like, I haven't been on a shoot without a DM250 or a really color accurate Flanders on set with me in a couple of years. So on set, I'm always looking at a monitor that is just about as accurate as you can get. And when you've got that level of accuracy, when you're looking at a signal that is like a very good reproduction of what your final image can look like, then yeah, you kind of want to be able to sit at that monitor. Like on a small shoot, it'll sometimes be like me and a gaffer and one G&E swing. And the ability for all of us to like set it up correctly at the beginning and then dial things in the ability to sort of do that simply sitting at the monitor uh, with a bunch of levels and not have to run around is actually kind of like a nice thing for certain kinds of documentary work. And and with a traditional DMX connector, it's not that expensive to buy like a DMX to a wireless DMX adapter like Moonlight makes one for uh, Lumen Radio makes the Moonlight for like 200 bucks. There's a bunch of others that are like, we'll let you work with wireless uh, DMX wirelessly. Um, I should there, mention you know, here that we don't yet carry a wireless uh, DMX controller, but I was oh. in a meeting this morning about picking up a wireless uh, DMX controller and that Lumen Radio Moonlight, Moonlight. Uh, wireless adapter. So yeah, we'll have those uh, soon. It's literally physically in my hand at this moment because they were nice enough to loan one to me for two weeks and I've been playing with it and I've been very, I've been very happy. I've been like, oh yeah, this is exactly what we need from these kind of things. Uh, We're finally getting to a place where this is all super affordable, but everything we've been talking about so far has been reasonably high end, like DMX, Mm -hmm. not high end DMX cables are really cheap. They're just XLR cables with five pins. Like it's not a super expensive thing. 
Wireless DMX, a little bit more expensive, but you should think about wireless DMX being very similar to like a Teradek or something. Like a Teradek is more expensive than an SDI cable, but then you don't have to run an SDI cable. Wireless DMX is very similar. The moonlight that's in my hands is pretty nice. There's a lot of lighting units that are starting to build it in. I think the new hives have wireless DMX built in native to the unit. But the other big flag that we've been talking that we haven't really been talking about here is you know, your iPad doesn't have wireless DMX built in. You're going to have to have something next to your iPad that's getting you onto that DMX network. It can be as simple as like, I use an airport router. So like Mm -hmm. I'll get my airport on and then you can use with Artnet or something, you can get to DMX through ethernet and then that will connect to the whole network. So that's all super doable. But Bluetooth is the other thing. The other sort of flag hanging out here is that most of these You know, when you think about the Hive app and the Aperture app and things like that, most of them operate on Bluetooth. The problem with Bluetooth, because 90% of what we do with Bluetooth in the world is designed to make you not think about its limitations, right? Like I have an Apple earbud in my ear right now or ear pod or whatever. It's Bluetooth. I'm never that far from my phone. I walk 10 feet from my phone. It still works. Most of Bluetooth is designed to hide its real distance limitation. But Bluetooth is designed not to go over long distances. That's its whole thing is Mm -hmm. it is a robust short-term connection. And so like I'm not trashing Hive in any way here. I've known John Miller of Hive for 10 years. He's a super great guy. He'd be the first to admit Bluetooth is not great. And so I connect, I use uh, an RGB Hive unit as my backlight and my little photography setup so I can have cool backlighty colors. And um, it's Bluetooth. And I walk like 10 feet away and it instantly disconnects. And so Bluetooth is not actually a robust enough protocol for what filmmakers want, right? On any bigger set, the number of times I disconnect from my hive because Bluetooth is just not the connection we want it to be is crazy. So what is interesting to me, and I haven't done a lot of testing on this yet. It is It was just announced at NAB in April, is Aperture is going to be pushing a Bluetooth mesh network, which means that every single individual light in the network is going to talk to every other light in the network. So if you light a whole light, uh, a whole stage with aperture CDS at, uh, lights, they will all talk to each other. And so as long as you're within range of any one of the lights, and as long as they're in range with each other, they will all talk to each other as a group and allow you to control them. So you could be physically much further from one of the lights on your set than you could be before. Now, this is exciting. Mesh control is really interesting. If there is a way to then get into that mesh control through DMX, I will be even especially excited. Um, I've been playing with it a little bit. I just got a couple of MCs. What's nice about it, especially Aperture's sort of, Aperture's a very good price for what they offer. They've really yeah. focused on like high output daylight units. They haven't done a lot of RGB stuff, but you know, the cheapest light in the CDS mesh, mesh network that I know of is 90 bucks. So it's entirely possible that if you wanted your controller to be a little further than set, you could just put a couple of the little $90 lights in between you and your stage, and it would sort of, the message will hop along them. It's an interesting workaround to go for a Bluetooth mesh thing. I don't know. I I just don't know how it is going to work. But on the flip side, wireless DMX has its own problem because wireless DMX uses the same 2.4 gigahertz frequency band that Wi-Fi does. It's not mm-hmm. Wi-Fi. You can't connect to wireless DMX directly from the Wi-Fi controller in your iPad. You have to use a bridge, but it's the same frequency network. And I've talked to a lot of people and I've been on a bunch of DJ forums lately where people have been very frustrated that in a very dense RF environment where there's like, you know, you go to a stadium now and you're doing live event lighting, but there's like a really robust Wi-Fi infrastructure at that stadium. It can be really hard to find a clear Wi-Fi channel. So like the going advice right now for live event people is you still bring cables with you as a backup for wireless DMX. It's going to be interesting to see if Bluetooth mesh networks become a thing we start using more of on set. It'll also be interesting. I mean, Aperture obviously is probably not interested in making this an open thing, but I always lean towards open things. I'm excited about Luminary. Oh, yeah. It's open and it's going to play for other things. If it works with Aperture, either if they open it up or. Because, you know, they're doing that contest right now where they're working with Quasar. They're making videos with Quasar. They're making videos mm-hmm. with Hive. Like, they're friendly. Yeah, and I or think if- some of their documentation seems to lean a little bit that way. When I was reading press releases about it, 
there was a mention of like at least it being on every aperture light, but possibly in the future supported by third party apps and maybe being a lighting standard. That would be nice. So it sounds like you're the perfect guy to be interviewing me about this. You've paid more attention to it than I have because I when the initial press releases went out, it wasn't even something I was thinking might be interesting as a standard. Again, we're going to have to see how it works, but it isn't it, it is good that someone's trying to push a Bluetooth mesh network because there's possibilities there that could be interesting definitely yeah and i i think those sorts of issues the wireless interference and so many lights and apps relying on either a bluetooth connection or ad ad hoc wi-fi connection probably one of many things that have sort of limited dmx pickup in the filmmaking world i think people are just afraid of losing a connection whereas a physical cable is a lot more if not actually reliable, at least feels more reliable. But what's funny is we're actually finally, I mean, I remember when like wireless video became something where no one trusted it. The first ACs wouldn't pull focus off of it. And it was a completely mm-hmm. like, okay, we're only going to do wireless when we're on steady cam because we have no choice. And then we're going to go straight back to 1080. And then within like a two year period, uh, Teradek Bolt was a part of that, but also Paralynx and, you know, some air units. All of the sudden, at this point, the default is just wireless video on sets. I think we're about to see similar things in the lighting space. I think once people have had a few good experiences where they're like, oh, I'm able to maintain control. All it takes is one shoot where you're halfway through an amazing take and the actor starts crying. And then one of the lights randomly auto switches to party mode and you ruin the take for people to set us back 10 years. Provided that's not happening. I think we're going to start to see more of that kind of thing. Also, frankly, it's going to start changing some things about cinematography. I remember in the 90s reading some article about how obsessed Toraro had gotten with DMX and how he refused to do any jobs where he couldn't DMX. And then you you watch, you know, his movies from that time period, Goya's Ghost and a few other things. And like the light is always changing. And it is sort of funny that like light is always changing in the world. Like when I'm out there in the universe, the light is constantly moving. But we get in this habit as filmmakers of like, I know when I want to do certain kind of effects that I'm like, all right, well, I need to have someone sitting on this light and someone sitting on this light. And to animate those kind of things, I I mentally sort of rule that out before I even get there, because I know that the tools I have don't do that easily and I need extra effort. And so I think one thing we're going to start seeing is we're going to start seeing people as it gets easier and easier to manipulate our lights over time, as it becomes a simpler thing to do. I think we're going to start seeing people change the way they light and we're going to start to see it become habitual that, of course, through the course of this scene, the lighting is going to change because it's a repeatable thing that we can now engage with on a regular basis. I think that's a great place to take a quick break. We'll come back and uh, we'll talk about some specific apps, what you look for in an app and uh, maybe some specific lights. Okay. And we're back. I'm here with Charles Hain, uh, cinematographer, acting director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema, co-host of the No Film School podcast. We're talking about lighting with apps. Uh, and I, I want to know, Charles, what you look for feature set wise in a lighting app. What makes one better than another? That gets into a really interesting space where we start talking about, you know, the definitions of UI and UX and all of those things. But the number one thing I'm looking for in lighting apps, and this is actually something that I think is really hard to do, is a lighting app that naturally guides you through the first steps of the process. And I don't think, honestly, any of them are doing it super well at this point. The issue we're in right now is most people assume they know how to use an app because we've all been using apps to do something for 10 years. A lot of these apps are targeted at people who already know how to do a lot of things. And so, you know, there's a one of the things I'm always trying to do in my teaching and in my writing articles is I'm always trying to start with like sort of a base level of like, here are the fundamental concepts you need to understand in order to move to the place of what you need to do. I think Luminaire does this really great in their videos. They have a a really robust infrastructure of videos on their website. But some of the other companies, their apps, even apps that I end up liking, you sort of open the app and there's a like. There's like a blank canvas and there's no real indication of what you should be doing next. There's no like, Mm -hmm. here's where you pair lights. There's no like, here's what a scene can do. There's no, it's very much, I think we're in a point in lighting app design right now where it's very much starting at the end where it's like, all right, we we know we want all of these features. So we're going to build a tool that has all of these features in it. 
But the journey of starting the app, the journey of like opening it for the first time and getting walked through, like, here's how you add lights. Here's how you animate scenes. Here's what a scene even means. I think that journey is one that none of the lights, none of the apps are are doing really well. I think even Luminaire, Luminaire is a great app, but like you really end up going to the website in order to get oriented to all of the power and techniques and tools that it has. What I'm really looking for for the next revision of all the apps is an app that's designed around the idea of, hey, you, I bet you're really experienced in cinematography, but know nothing about apps. And they're Mm -hmm. they're not really quite in that space yet. They're all sort of assuming that all of the concepts are already understood and they're just taking you right into the feature set. Um, One interesting thing that just happened that I thought was sort of a, a nice move was Hive, one of their initial moves with their shot app was they started with the shot app just gave you basic features and then you had to pay for any kind of upgrades. The upgrades were, you know, I think $199 or something to get like a firelight effect or something like that. I think it was at least partially Hive trying to find a way to monetize the app. And uh, that's fair. You got to figure out a way to do it. They just last month completely redid their app. It is all of the features that used to be paid upgrades are now free. If you send in your receipt for having paid for the upgrades, you'll get a T-shirt like they definitely made sure to take care of the original purchasers, which I think is smart. But I think the other thing they really did is they sort of leaned into accepting that it's like this is not going to be a profit center for us. This is something we just have to pay to develop and we're not going to get money back from it. And I do think the Hive app does the best job of the ones I've been playing with of sort of starting with a very basic, here's where you go to attach a light. Here are the controls. But the Hive light doesn't have scenes. I can't animate in a scene. If I wanted to animate that light, if I wanted to pre-program an animation where it took a minute to dim up, like a mimic a sunrise effect, you wouldn't do that in the shot app. You'd have to attach it via DMX to Luminaire. There are also some that are just total gibberish. There's one, again, I, I probably I won't really talk about the company, but there's one that's trying to do some very sophisticated things and failing. And for me, I love the idea of really sophisticated things. There's like one company out there where you can like, you light your scene and then you take a photo of the setup. And then in the app, you can like touch each light in the photo and then it will take control of that light. That is a brilliant I know exactly idea. the app you're talking about. It does not work. And yeah, because you don't want to mention it, I won't mention it either, the name of the company, but we got that light and app in to test. We were really excited about carrying it and didn't carry it because that app was uh, not where it needs to be. It is nowhere near where. And like, it's one of those things where I'm like, huh? How are you guys? Like, I don't know why I'm being so careful about mentioning it because it's not like I like. It's just one. I'll do it if you want me to. I just, (laughs) it's one of those things. I have, I have sort of a personal rule as like, I don't know if I'm a journalist or not because I write reviews for websites, but like, I have a rule where I try and only say nasty stuff about big companies. Yeah. Like, if you're a small enough company, I feel like, you know what? I'm just going to give you time and patience and I'll just not cover you at all. If I, if I don't like your thing, I'm just not going to cover it if you're small enough. Yeah. If if I don't like your thing and you're, yeah. Like, Apple, I hated the 2016 MacBook Pro. I actually think the 2018 is pretty good. And I wrote the most vicious review I've ever written of the 2016 MacBook Pro because I hated it so much. Mm-hmm. But you're Apple. You can you can handle me being mean. And I actually know some people at Apple now, and they gave me a tour of the big facility despite <laughs> having written that negative review. So it didn't seem to ruin that relationship. Yeah. But and this company, it just seems like it is at least to it's trying something. They're trying legitimately cool shit. It's a shame that it like didn't work out, but at least there was stuff in that app that would have been really interesting and cool if it worked. There are legitimate swings in that app where where I'm like, you are trying something cool. But I think that app is a really great example of what I was saying earlier of like their lights are actually nice. But just because you're good at making lights doesn't mean you're good at making apps. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's weird about that light in particular is it's so app dependent. Like there's two buttons with no labels on that light. Right. Yeah. There's no physical control. If the app isn't working, you're kind of out of luck. Whereas like, I just reviewed the Pavo tubes from Nanlite, which are like, you know, an affordable battery powered waterproof tube. I really liked them. They don't have an app and I emailed them and they're like, we're working on it. It's not done yet. We don't really think of this as an app light. But they have six buttons and a little menu screen on and I could do everything I want. The cop car effects, fire lights effects, everything with just the buttons on the thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would way rather have six buttons in a menu than 
two buttons and a terrible app. Right. And I like I liked that Nanlite was like, we don't really have an app. Don't worry about the app. We'll have an app someday. Just use the buttons on the thing and we'll give you enough buttons. And that's what's interesting to me about that particular company and the swings they took. If you're going to make those swings, you have to pull a lot of resources into supporting it. And like, I don't know how many people Ari have working on Stellar, but Ari has a team on Stellar. Mm-hmm. I can guarantee you there are multiple engineers with certifications in UI and UX who like are just making Stellar great. And Luminaire is a team of people yeah. in Kentucky, which I love that it's Kentucky. Uh, I love the heartland. Like, I, I just love it when there's like film companies that aren't just in New York and L.A. Absolutely. Who are out there who are like completely devoted to making Luminaire the best it can be and nothing else and who are rolling in new features all the time and who are making it really interesting. And frankly, I, w- I, I wish more companies would just be like, do the Quasar thing of like, yeah, we don't have an app, use Luminaire. And, you know, it's it's probably rare, especially below a certain budget level, for somebody to only be working with one type of light on a set, right? Yes. Like you're not only working with RE lights or only working with a bunch of light panels. You're probably mixing sources. So it has it helps to have something like Luminaire that's using an open protocol like DMX that will just work with multiple things. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Although it is funny because the one thing that's the one exception to that is I know a lot of people bigger DPs than me, like people I'm friends with who are a few steps above me who are like, I only shoot airy sky panels. That's the only LED I let on my set. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite at that point in my career, but I know a few people who are like that. And so the Stellar app is very good for them. I'm curious if you know offhand or can describe offhand of any particular setups or instances where you know these wireless control apps have come in helpful for you honestly i feel like i'm in this weird place where i'm evangelizing things that i'm not really uh applying very often yet because i'll be on a shoot with people and they'd be like hey but the app does this and the app does that and so like i feel like i'm still getting the people i work with or teach sort of up to speed on playing with them The biggest thing for me right now is trying to implement it, but it's not actually been finished being implemented. Sort of an auto balance thing where as the light changes in the background of the scene, I'm able to implement it across the foreground. I think, you know, I have a couple shoots coming up where I'm pitching the creative differently. The creative I am pitching is about the lighting change throughout the course of the scene because I know how much easier it is to do it now. So I think personally for me, I'm in that place where I'm changing, I'm changing the ideas I'm bringing to the table because I'm thinking about it in a new way. Because, you know, whenever you're pitching creative, you're always, you always want to pitch creative that's a little bit out of your comfort zone. But I think we all, hopefully by, I'm 40 now, hopefully by 40, I've gotten good at not pitching creative that would be physically impossible to do. Like I don't pitch creative where I'm like, oh, this is a $10,000 job. All right, well, we're going to blow up a Rolls Royce. And then it's going to fall off a cliff and land. You know, it's like you're always trying to fit your creative just a little outside your budget and your comfort zone. And now I'm in the process where I'm like, oh, but I can totally make this whole scene built around this whole lighting change effect, even though I know I'm only going to have three people with me on this job because it's a low budget job and yada, yada, yada. Because we're so nervous about it as a tool, I don't think it's going to be a tool that's going to work its way back from set. And we start doing it on set and then we go backwards to creative. I think it's going to be something where as you play with it on test days, because I think everybody still does test days, Mm -hmm. as you play with it more and more on test days, you get better ideas about what you can do with it in the indie affordable space. All of these things as filmmakers are about trying to get us in that place where we just feel habitual about things, where it's part of our brain space. And yeah, that's where it is for me. I'm actually working on. Uh, a couple of things where it's just sort of like in the design plan for the scene, knowing I can do it is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. More just a tool to have in your back pocket in case. Yeah. Well, perfect. We will put links up to all these products in the show notes. Uh, cool. Internals pages if we carry them. Uh, regular product pages if we don't. Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hey, this was super fun. Uh, you can do we do do we plug pluggables at the end of the show? Absolutely. I know you co-host the No Film School podcast. Uh, anything else you're working on right now? So I also if so I co-host the No Film School podcast where we talk about all sorts of stuff. If you're into just deep nerd stuff, I have another podcast called The Week in Film Tech that is just like my covering of whatever film nerd stories there are where I go a little deeper than we would go in the no film school podcast. And I write a bunch of articles on the, on no film school. I got two books out. One is business and entrepreneurship for filmmakers. The other is color grading one one 
And you can always hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Charles Hain, H-A-I-N-E. Perfect. Yeah, we will link to all that stuff in the show notes as well. Thanks again for coming in. Cool. This was such a pleasure. You were It was a, it was a genuine joy. All right. Have a good one. You too. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. If you have any questions or comments, let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. 